Hey, Bankless Nation, the title for today's episode, are we at the end game now? David and I are talking about macro, got to pop our heads up from everything that's going on in SBF with FTX and uh, look at the wider world here, because I think there are some looming macro questions that face us as we are ending 2022 and going into 2023 We have the perfect guest to talk about them. But the big questions in my mind that I asked this uh, macro analyst is a, a guest I think has some fantastic perspectives on this. How did we get here, right? Like, what's the history of, of how we got here? Where are we now? Pinpoint us on the map. When do we pivot? When is this Fed pivot going to happen? What's Powell's next move? And lastly, is this the end? I don't mean the end of all human civilization, David. I'm talking about like oh, thank God. the end, the, the, the end of this um, credit debt cycle mm. that we seem to be in. Ray Dalio talks about this, right? You only get so many spins right. at this wheel before everything falls apart. Uh, so who do we have on the episode and uh, why, why is this important? Yeah, we have a, a macro commentator, Itai, who has come in with a bunch of charts. Uh, so if you are listening to the podcast, you might actually want to go over to the YouTube because this will be a very chart heavy episode, which we don't get very often uh, here on the show at Bankless. But when we do, everyone loves it, including myself. Uh, and so Itai has uh, a, just a long history of charts, uh, as in like it goes back, the first part of the show is going to go back many decades. Uh, but then as we progress throughout the show, we're going to get no more and more up to modern times and be able to actually hopefully try to project what happens next and are we at the end of the road. And Ryan, this is the first week in a long time where we have zero SBF related content, and I am just absolutely here for it. I can't wait till we no longer have to say we don't have SBF content this week. <laughs> That'll be the next step of the phase. But uh, yes, um, talking about macro today, and it's refreshing to get back to some of these these base essentials. David, you know what's also refreshing is talking about 2023 and where your health benefits are going to come from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a time for me for like kind of planning. I always do that at the end of the year. I'm like, okay, what 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 should I get in place for next year? And uh, health benefits, one of those things that are very important for a lot of web people who are in Web3 and crypto um, because they're contractors. They're maybe working for DAOs. Tell them a little bit about our friends and sponsors over at Opolis. Yeah, Opolis is helping you, the Web3 worker, the crypto entrepreneur, uh, deal with all of your nation state burdens while allowing you to do all of the things that you do best, which is work. Uh, and so famously, uh, being an independent worker, uh, either working for a DAO, an NFT artist, uh, very freeing. We, we love these things. But sadly, some of the things like uh, tax management and healthcare and payroll uh, do not come with some of these crazy new weird jobs that we create on the Web3 frontier. So Opolis helps you do all of those things, helps you live your life uh, while like do, getting your health care, doing your taxes, uh, but, but doing crazy weird Web3 jobs on the frontier. Uh, and they also have this brand new promotion coming out of Opolis where you have can get a thousand bank and a thousand work tokens, the tokens of Opolis, if you sign up by December 31st of this year, which is this month, by the way. Uh, so there is a link in the show notes to get started. If you want to use Opolis to get affordable medical, dental, vision, insurance, and all their other services, is because Opolis is a co-op. So when you use Opolis, you also become an owner of Opolis. Do the fun stuff in Web3. Do the adult stuff with Opolis. Uh, that, I think, is what you can unlock here. All right, guys, we are going to be right back with our episode talking to Itai Vinick all about macro. Is this the end? But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. The Brave Wallet 
is your secure multi-chain on-ramp into Web3 and is built directly into the Brave privacy browser. Gone are the days of managing multiple wallet extensions that put you at risk of phishing, spoofs, and tracking. With the Brave wallet, you can securely manage your crypto assets across more than 100 different chains, including Ethereum, Layer 2s, Solana, and more, all without downloading risky extensions. The Brave wallet is easy to set up and removes the headache of jumping between wallets and extensions. It's lightweight, but packed with great features like built-in token swaps, buying and holding NFTs with a gallery view, and support for hardware wallets. But also much more than that, because Brave is shipping new features every single month with a mission to make Web3 easier to navigate for its over 55 million users. Wallet extensions are a thing of the past. So get started with Brave's Web3 Ready browser today and experience a decentralized web seamlessly without all the clutter. You can download the browser at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does PO apps and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. And you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. Bankless Nation, are we at the end game now? How did we get here? Where are we now? When do we pivot? What's going to happen with the Fed? We have the perfect guest to talk about these subjects. Itai Vinik is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Equi, which is an alternative investment platform. He knows a ton about the questions we are asking. In fact, uh, we had a conversation, it's probably what, six weeks ago or so, Itai, where yeah, just, I was like, just about. okay, I was like, you know this space very well. You have the charts and data to kind of uh, tell a story. Could you come help the crypto community and the bankless community make sense of what's happening, what got us here, and where we are now. So uh, Itai, it's great to have you on Bankless. And thanks in advance for your help in understanding these complicated subjects. Yeah, no, no, no problem. And especially because you, know, you do have to have a pretty good understanding of history and um, macro history in order to really understand how the current environment is being influenced by some of these events that even took place seven years ago. Can, can I ask you before we get into the questions of like, um, how, how did you learn this stuff? Like, how do you get up to speed and get educated on understanding macro? It just seems like there are so many different topics. What's your story on how you got here? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, I started my career at, at UBS, um, being an analyst and really passionate about financial markets, reading everything that I could and slowly putting the pieces together. Um, after that, I started a, a hedge fund to trade at volatility. So it was pretty important to understand how some of these events can influence the volatility regimes in the market. Um, so really, it's 15 years of experience of just putting it together. Um, and it just, you know, it adds up and knowledge gets compounded. And, you know, when you understand these things and you connect the dots correctly, it could be very rewarding. So Itai, I, I know you have kind of a foot in, in crypto, but also a foot out, like you're not 100% all in crypto, like you're also looking at other alternative investments and, and macro in general. Um, what's your sense of like crypto and what's kind of your experience in it? G give the bankless community uh, some idea there. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've dabbled in crypto um, for a few years now. Um, really um, for our firm, what we've done prior was crypto lending that now I guess get, has a little bit of a bad, uh, of a bad rep uh, plus um, DeFi and Delta neutral DeFi really. So figured that the arbitrage opportunities in crypto were, were quite a bit for taking, you know, they were, they were rewarding you enough to not take direct price risk. However, we exited crypto lending in May after Terra Luna, even though we had no exposure to Terra Luna, I was just worried about systemic risk generally. And I was thinking, hmm. What kind of firm has too much leverage that we don't know about? So even though we had exposure to BlockFi and Gemini, we actually exited both in May. Um, wow. wow. Can, by the way, can you like uh, DM me next time you get that spidey sense? Uh, yeah. that, that could be good to know. Yeah, yeah. Our exposure wasn't huge, but we were using BlockFi as kind of a cash substitute. But then 
once Terra Luna happened, you know, the, the, the CFI type of risk was high, um, but also DeFi risk was high, with, as we've seen with Terra Luna. And, you know, I was just worried that players in the space, even the bigger companies are just not managing risk correctly. And we exited crypto entirely in May as a result. Can you just maybe elaborate on what were the inputs to go into that decision? Was it like just your spidey senses? Was it just uh, experiencing contagion in other markets? Because I feel like, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I don't have intrinsic details into like the whole state of the entire crypto industry and how we reacted to Terra Luna. But I think from my limited scope of what I can see, like most people were turn either this willful blindness, but no one wanted to believe that there was so much contagion. So like, can you well, talk about like what your experiences were and why you decided to make that move? And I think the thing too, David, I don't know if this resonates with you, but like is some people saw after Luna like that there would be fallout and contagion, mm -hmm. but the, I feel like the FTX thing caught a lot of people by surprise. Right. Like I thought all the damage had sort of started to work its way through the system. Right. And then there was this other like secondary, it was like a one, two combo punch and the second punch just hit us right in the gut. Yeah. So to me, for, first off, I would make it clear that even though we did crypto lending, we never did algorithmic stable coins just because we were worried that they're not really backed by anything, but the good faith of whatever VC is backing that particular project. And I was thinking at the time that there's a lot more centralized risk in the crypto space than what a lot of people believed, because when you're looking at all these different projects that are supposedly decentralized, they're not really decentralized because there are backers across um, and it's really fueled or was fueled by VC dollars. Um, so as a result, when we saw what happened to Terra Luna, the decision was really, this is, this is kind of a new space. There is no central bank, which is kind of the point, right? But um, there is no central bank. So we don't know who has too much leverage. We don't know what kind of asset toxic ratios are out there into different firms. And if there's a true shock event and a real stress test, it's kind of impossible to know who's good, who's the good player and who's the bad player. So from an abundance of caution to, to our investors, we just decided to exit the space entirely, focus on some of the other assets that we trade and um and wait and see um how it kind of plays out well well played sir uh, uh what, what are the other questions i i have uh before we get into the charts one, one of the charts that you have is about consumer sentiment which uh is related to a number of things that we'll talk about but as we go through this charts and as we kind of place ourselves in the macro context ite what's your sentiment are you scared are you optimistic like overall what's your vibe yeah, I try not to. Um, I try not to mix emotions with investing too much, generally speaking. So when I look at the environment as a whole, our goal is to protect capital during periods of volatility, which we've done fairly well. I think we've outperformed S and P by sixteen or so percent, um, with with maybe a fraction of the volatility. But really, it's it's what is the market going to do? Is the market going to move in one specific way? Is diversification going to work? Because what we've seen correlation is picked up with all asset classes, right? So, um, you know, bonds, crypto, gold, S and P have all been one trade. So diversification has not worked. So we 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 had we add to hedging when that happens. So it's really not so much about sentiment, but more about understanding the moves and reacting to them in a way that our goal is to make money regardless, right? Well, I think without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get into some of the charts because we all love charts here on Bankless. Uh, Itai, you want to guide us through some of the charts? What do you have up first? Yeah. So first off, um, I thought we would start with a little bit of a history introduction to the to the general macro environment. And the, the first question was, how did we get here? And I divided it into a few sections, um, really going back to World War II. and ending in the current era and and it is all related so you know the broader the broader idea is that we had the Brentwood system that many of you probably know what it was uh, in 1944 uh, the 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 winners of World War II really got together and decided to create a new monetary system for the world in which the US dollar was king and it was the central currency all the other currencies were pegged to the US dollar and then the US dollar had the ability to convert into gold um, 
However, in the 1960s and 70s, early 70s, uh, the U.S. was abusing the system by running a large deficit for the Vietnam War and other social programs. And other nations started asking for their gold back. And um, under that, those, those terms of that pr prior arrangement, the U.S. had to deliver the gold. They didn't want to do so because they were running out of it. So in 1971, Nixon just dropped us out of the gold standard and the modern era began. So the era we all know, the fiat era, era of higher inflation, that really all starts at that time in 1971. Um, the 1970s were a period of stagflation. So we've heard that term this year as well, and I think it's very relevant. Um, up until that point, it was pretty much the conventional wisdom that high inflation can exist at the same time of a recession, right? Because a recession has declining consumer demand and things of that sort. So it, it tempers inflation, but we've seen both inflation and a recession hitting us simultaneously in the 70s. And the main reason for that is most likely supply side shocks in which even though demand is dropping, supply is contracting even further and that's causing inflation at the same time. So 1970s had a lot of oil price shocks. And we've seen some similar things this um, last couple of years post COVID, we've had a pretty big supply squeeze causing a lot of inflation. Um, so some, you know, some people have brought back the stagflationary um, era. So once that was over, um, we really got the Volcker era, um, early 1980s, Paul Volcker decided he's going to do whatever it takes to stop inflation. That was really the first time the Fed stepped in to really combat inflation in a very aggressive manner. He raised the federal fund rates to the double digits, which we can't even imagine today what, what that would look like, right? Um, so he really was able to crush inflation, but it did cost a pretty heavy recession in the, in the early 1980s. Um, following that, we had a pretty, pretty good decade up until 1987. The famous Black Monday crash takes place and Alan Greenspan really introduces the idea of the Fed put. The Fed reduces rates for the first time in response to the stock market and not the real economy, which is really interesting. Um, the real economy didn't even go through a recession in 1987, and we've had the biggest drop since 1929. So the Fed didn't even wait for the real economy to be hit. It reacted to the market. That was really the defining moment that started the modern era, in my opinion, for this type of uh, Fed interventions. Um, we can look at this chart, actually, as we, as we continue to talk about the history, because what's interesting is that every single time that the Fed reacts to one of these events, the, the trough is lower, and then the high is lower as well. And, and Itai, I, I want to, um, could you describe what we're looking at from a chart for perspective for those who, who don't see it on YouTube? Um, so this is uh, Global Central Bank Policy Rates. So that thing you were just talking about, that you know, the, that Volcker raised and Greenspan kind of dropped, like the Fed fund rates, which is basically the central bank policy rate. It's kind of the interest rate undergirding all other interest rates. And I think what we see on the chart is from maybe 1970 all the way till now, uh, this the various central bank policy rates. And they all kind of follow this blue line, which is the U.S. So everybody is following kind of the U.S. monetary policy, but then we also have uh, the ECB, that's Europe. We have England, Bank of uh, England. We have Canada, the Bank of Canada, uh, Bank of Japan. So we have all of the major uh, Western, I guess, central bank policy rates here in the chart. Uh, is there anything else you'd point out in this chart? Uh, no, that's a, that's a very good description. Um, so what I would say is that the interesting part, since those, that, that period of the early 1980s, uh, every time that the Fed reacts with lower interest rates, it's from a lower and lower place. So in the 90s were interesting because we add one more thing to this mix. In 1997, a very famous hedge fund um, that was started by Nobel Prize winners, um, actually the ones that discovered the, the Black and Scholes options model blew up. It was called LTCM, Long-Term Capital Management. And that was the first time when the Fed literally bailed out a company in order to save the market. Oh, really? So when, when was this? So this was earlier than 2008, where we saw a lot of that. This is 1997. This is 1997. Yeah. So and what was the rationale then? Too big to fail still? Yeah. So they, they basically put bets that exceeded $1 trillion because there were 100 to 1 leverage. And they, they thought that they know how to hedge all the risk because they literally invented the options model. God, that sounds so familiar. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen some of that in crypto. 
<laughs> so you know that 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 has happened many times before, right? There was they were it was called the Midas formula. Like we were able to cancel out risk. You can't lose. Um, <laughs> so that happened in 1997. The systemic risk was so great that they they bailed them out in 1997, and there was a big criticism of that, saying that you know it creates a lot of moral hazard. What prevents the bigger Wall Street banks from doing the same thing, knowing that the Fed had bailed out a much smaller hedge fund? And of course, we all know that 11 years later, that's exactly what happened. Um, so this so is yeah, what we're seeing on the chart here is just kind of each each cycle, I guess the the highs of the interest rate are lower, are, are, are lower and the lows are also lower. And it kind of looks like it drops down to like this bottom the line, which is which is the floor at zero. And I don't even know, didn't some of these banks um, go into kind of the negative territory? I don't even know if we could see that on the, on yeah, the graph. The, but... the, the ECB in Japan did, you see it right there. Um, you know, I Japan see. still has somewhat of a, you know, now maybe not, but they're, they're still very close to zero if they're not at zero for some things. And they also have other very extreme but policies. We're in the basement here. Like the graph is kind of breaking. Yeah. The big takeaway here is that after the global financial crisis, We've, re we've hit the zero bound for the first time. And what do you do when you hit the zero bound and nothing works? You have to go to something very unorthodox, which was QE, quantitative easing, which is a very fancy way of saying printing out a bunch of money. So not only were at the zero bound, you started printing out a lot of money. Which, which printing out a lot of money, that's, has, that's effectively going negative, right? Like if you can't go negative on the interest rates, you go negative by printing money. It's kind of how we did go below that floor, right? In a way, yeah, in a way. And, and, and that was a really interesting and also very controversial exper experiment. Ben Bernanke, I think in 2012, was saying that he believed it was justified in order to trigger the wealth effect. The idea that if people feel wealthier because the stock market is rising, then they're gonna, there's going to be more consumer spending. Um, and then the real economy will go into a virtuous cycle. Now, that's never been proven to actually work, by the way. That was the theory. Yeah, that seems kind of crazy. Just uh, to having you explain to me like that was the theory. That seems <laughs> nuts. <laughs> that was the theory. Um, yeah, so, show us some other charts here. So, what's the effect of all of this? In the, so, this yeah. is really the this is really the Fed's balance sheet going back to 1995. You can see it was pretty not a, not a big deal, just slowly grinding up. But up until 2008, then the big ex ex experiment starts. And what was interesting is every time they stopped, the economy went into a crisis. The economy became addicted to liquidity. When QE1 was halted, we got the um, flash crash in 2010. QE2 was halted. We got the European debt crisis. Um, and then et cetera, et cetera, to the point that when COVID happened, they went just crazy. They were like, okay, we're just going to double the balance sheet in a year. And Okay. So... A, a couple of questions about this. So on the chart, for those that can't see, we're starting around like 1995 and we're starting at what does this look like? Um, half a, uh, you know, $500 billion or something like that. These are trillions actually. These are trillions. Okay. So is this 1 trillion at the beginning of 1999, something like that? Even less that probably three, 400 billion. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, and then now we are like 2022. We are, I don't know, what, eight, eight trillion or so? Eight and a half, nine trillion, something, and, something of that sort. And you can see this is, this is ascending in a very kind of like policy driven way where you get like these, a thing happens and then you get a spike up. And then another thing happens. It's not, it's not, it doesn't look very organic. Like the charts I see in kind of crypto, you know, trading charts are like up, down. This is like a thing happens and then boom, money spikes up. But for people who are like confused about terms like balance sheet, right? This is effectively how much the central bank of the United States owes, I guess, right? This is their liabilities. They owe people. And like, like when we say, owe, like, what does that mean? Who do they, who do they owe? Who does the U S central bank owe eight uh, trillion dollars to? So it's actually not that they owe. It's actually kind of the other way around. It's the U S treasury that owes the fed money. So what, what happens is the fed creates money out of thin air. And then they use that to buy U.S. treasuries and literally giving money to the U.S. government. So those treasuries that the Fed holds as a, on their balance sheet are assets. It's the U.S. Treasury that has that as a liability. But it was assets that were literally created out, out of thin air because they have the ability to press a button, create money, use that money to just buy treasuries. So it was the treasury, it was the bond market, the bond 
the price of bonds that were being propped up by all of this QE. That is correct. The, 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 the interest, it, it, it actually works in two different ways. One way is the U.S. government gets a bunch more money that they can spend in all their social programs and social security and all the other things they have a deficit at because they obviously tax revenue is not enough to cover that. And then the second thing is while buying long-term treasuries, they're able to suppress long-term interest rates because bond interest rates and price are inversely correlated. Okay. So we got a massively expanding balance sheet and, um, this it, is all it's important to know that any time that the the I think the point important point that we want to draw out of the slides that that Itai brought up is that any time that they don't do QE, something in the world breaks, and, <laughs> and so the politicians their hands just feel forced because you know no one wants to be in charge of things that break, uh, and so they try and not break it, and so they do more QE. Okay, Itai, can you walk us through like I, just really quickly like all the things that broke? Because you you talked about like the, the European markets broke, so the, the the parts of the economy that broke weren't it wasn't even the United States economy. It was like parts small pockets of the global economy that would throw a fit, right? Yes, and and usually that happens because the dollar appreciates quite a bit when when we go into one of these um, dollar drain periods, and um, the dollar index increasing also correlates with 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 problems around the world. But just generally speaking, yeah, we had the 2010 flash crash, the first hold of QE. We had the European debt crisis, 2011, the second time that happened. Um, when QE3 was halted, that was in 2018, it was a very volatile year. Um, I know in, into December, I remember Mnuchin was calling the heads of all the banks, saying what, what's going on. Um, and then the Fed resumed QE. Uh, it actually did some repo activity before COVID even happened to put liquidity back. and then. When COVID started, they had the perfect excuse to flood a ton of liquidity again into the system. And this is exactly what makes 2022 so challenging, is that now, for the first time since the 1980s, the Fed has to deal with actual inflation. So their hands are kind of tied. They're, they don't have the ability to flood liquidity again the way they were able to do so since the global financial crisis. And that's really the core of the problem. You, you said that once COVID hit, they had the perfect excuse to do more QE. The way that you phrased it makes it seem like the fed is like dude when when can how can we do more qe like how yeah. can we get this done like why <laughs> why did you say it like that because it's 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 been the easy solution right up until up until 2020 and 2021 really um there was uh, i'll go back a little bit in 2008 2009 when this was first happening uh crypto wasn't really a thing and everybody was buying gold and then gold had this huge bubble into 2011 and then kind of a kind of a crash. And the reasoning behind that was all this money printing is going to cause a ton of inflation. Now, guess what? It didn't happen. There was no inflation. A whole decade was done with QE continuously happening. Asset prices were, were booming. We're in this Goldilocks environment. No inflation. Then we get COVID. Something changes and we get inflation. So the Fed didn't even realize that QE was a problem because there were no you know, there's no real world impact to it, really. Inflation was just fine. Can we talk about that, though? No real world impact that they could measure in the, the dials that they were measuring. I mean, if you could talk about, like, some of the recipients of this, maybe I know you have a slide in here that talks about, like, shows stock market returns, right? And yep. this is interesting because all of this money printing, all of this QE um, was good for a number of people, uh, people was. in the U.S., people worldwide particularly if you held assets, this could be stocks, those could be um, you know, risk on assets, it could be uh, property, it could be houses, and uh, maybe we'll get you to describe you know, the chart here, but you, you kind of said this word of like, it, it seemed to have no bad effects. I mean, it seemed to have some good effects, which is asset price increase, and maybe talk about that, but like also there were some bad effects, right? Is this a story about wealth inequality as well and some of the kind of societal fray, fraying and, and uh, rippling that, that happens when you're just like printing money? It definitely, it definitely is. Um, but however, there was no bad effect that the Fed could measure. So I will rephrase that as, as, as far as that goes. As far as they were concerned, banks were getting recapitalized, asset prices were doing well. And there was no real CPI inflation. Having said that, I think that it's a sort of hidden tax because the QE period during the Goldilocks when CPI inflation was not high, um, 
really benefited asset prices in a way that if you if you're a wage earner, you're not your wage is not increasing nearly enough as the value of assets. And most wealthy own assets, which means that the wealthy just got wealthier and the wealth gap did increase during QE, just as you mentioned, Ryan. Um, but having said that, we still didn't have real CPI inflation. It was asset price inflation. And that's really what QE did initially. So what chart are we looking at here? I mean, this looks like an absolute uh, run up on this, on this blue line here. And it goes all the way to 1995 all the way to kind of present times. And I think this is tracking like growth stocks. This would be the NASDAQ 100 and that's right. the blue line. And then there's a red line that kind of like, uh, it looks like it's t pretty correlated, tightly correlated with it. Maybe you could describe the relationship and that is the Fed balance sheet. What are we looking at here? Yeah, so that's back to that, you know, eight, eight some trillion dollar number of US treasury. So it's really a measure of how much liquidity is getting pushed into the market in a way of money creation uh, with quantitative easing. And what you can see, the response to COVID um, was so massive because the world was locked up and they thought that they needed to offset all that organic um, transactions that, that take place with just money printing. So the initial reaction to COVID was risk assets just went on a tear. And you guys would know it too, because crypto was one of the ones that was most impacted by 2020 money printing. Um, and then really, you can see that periods where money printing is contracting doesn't really have great returns for stock price uh, for, for asset prices like risk assets like the NASDAQ. And in 2022, even such a small decline in the balance sheets has created a lot of pain. Um, so, you know, would I say that markets are, uh, markets are somewhat addicted to this liquidity? I am definitely in the opinion that they are because something very dramatic changed post the global financial crisis. When we got to that zero bound, markets became a lot more dependent on Fed liquidity and a lot less dependent on actual fundamentals. All right, so, so the market is using like the words addicted and dependent. And I'm just got this visual of like the economy in some sort of hospital bed on some IV drip. And mm -hmm. every time the IV drip gets yoinked, the patient just dies. Freaks yeah, out. I mean, I, unfortunately, when you get more and more debt in the system, that that's kind of how it is, because ser servicing that debt at some up until some point, debt is very positive, right? You want to start a business, mm -hmm. you're going to borrow some money and then you're going to do some sales and then your business is going to grow because of the debt you took. But at some point you get so much debt that it's becoming problematic. Something you have to, you. yeah, it starts, starts biting you back. You need to, you know, it's really hurting your growth potential. So the economy, in my opinion, has passed that stage, which is creating a lot of drag on growth, right? And, and the, really the moment was the global financial crisis. So let's just finish out this, how did we get here story and uh, let, let's zip through the next three charts and let, let kind of uh, sum it up. So the, the next one is, this is the COVID stimulus uh, programs. And so uh, this is basically just showing the massive fiscal stimulus that was injected into the economy. Is anything you want to say on this? That was, yeah. So, you know, people ask, so how come in COVID we got real inflation? Why, why did that happen? We've been doing money printing since 08, 09 true. The difference is that 2020 was really the first global ex experiment, in my opinion, with helicopter money. Call it as you want, but people just had money dropped into them on them, whether it was through stimulus checks, whether it was through unemployment benefits. And the economy was closed, so they didn't have the ability to really spend it. Um, and that was different because we had money printing and we have fiscal stimulus at the same time, monetary and fiscal combined. And that created real world inflation for the first time. Got it. And then this, this other piece, the personal savings rate, you see kind of the same effect of, I guess, stimulus and the post stimulus. And this looks like, you know, you can literally see it. Yeah. So what this is this? Is the, this is the first stimulus check. This is the second. And then in red, you can see the credit card debt outstanding for the average consumer in the United States. So what we see now is that the savings rate is already lower than what it was pre COVID and credit card debt is in a new all time high. So if we do fall into a recession, the consumer is not in good shape right now. It's actually, you can make the argument that they're actually worse off now than they were prior to getting all that stimulus. Do you think but, that the I'm, creation of the stimulus and the creation of the money created that outcome? I think it's a mix of that plus some COVID closures and other things like that where the economy was, was closed up. But you can make the argument that all this was sort of for nothing because now the consumer is in a worse off place 
and we are dealing with a big inflationary problem and we're also dealing with a huge debt problem. Okay. All right. So how did we get here? We saw how we got here, right? A whole bunch of money printing. You kind of guided us through, but it's, it's really kind of that simple. Like we printed a whole lot of money uh, for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, this is M2 supply that we're looking at. Is there anything you want to say about this? And by the way, what, what is M, M2? That, that is a measure of money. Is that um, savings accounts as well as base money? Yeah, it's a broader it's a broader definition of money supply. M one is the just the um, just the actual fiat money in circulation. This is a broader definition, including accounts, and it's just staggering, right? There was a forty percent increase in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one in the, just money in circulation. The total supply of money. It, it'd Correct. be like I mean, for people in crypto, right? It's like let's say Bitcoin next year. You remember that twenty one million hard cap thing? Well, for one year. We're just going to increase the total supply of Bitcoin by, say, another 8 million. You know, how about we round it up? 30 million Bitcoin. We'll just do it one time. 40% increase one year. What does that do (laughs) to, like, the Bitcoin? Like, well, probably uh, it's a lot more drastic because it's a much more honest market than kind of this market. Because people would just get out of Bitcoin. Prices would drop. Like, uh, all sorts of chaos would ensue. Well, that's effectively what we did here is just a token issuance of USD coin by 40%. Boom, hits you with that. And now we're seeing all of the, the after effects of this. And so what are the after effects of, um, how did we get here? It feels like, you know, where is here uh, is, 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 is kind of the next question. But uh, right. what we have is we have is inflation, uh, both CPI inflation, asset price inflation, rampant wealth inequality that spilled over into our, our politics and it's starting to fray the structure of, of uh, society. And I think the big question now from a macro perspective is, all right, where are we now on this map, right? So um, take us there. Us the what, yeah, give us the punchline of like December 2022 going into 2023. So the punchline is this, um, in my opinion, the Fed has realized that they've made a giant mistake. They've realized that probably late 2021, and they are trying to reverse that mistake. So they are doing a few things to do so. They're doing the most aggressive interest rate increases since the 1980s, right? We've raised interest rates 75 basis points now. I don't know how many meetings in a row. We're approaching very restrictive monetary policy. Financial conditions have deteriorated. But more so, one of the things that Sless talked about, they're doing money printing in reverse. So they are destroying, actively destroying around $100 billion of USD every single month in order to literally reduce the amount of USD in circulation. So they're doing the exact opposite. For crypto people, they're burning. This is a, a burn mechanism like EIP-1559 for the Fed, though. Where are they getting that money? So what they're doing is as they printed the money and they purchased treasuries, now they're doing the opposite. As these treasuries mature, mm-hmm. the US Treasury is sending them back their principal and the interest. And then they just click the delete button and they just take that money out of circulation. Token burn, baby. Okay, so who, wait, so who, the government has less money now? Who has less money? It's total supply, right? Yeah, it's just the total supply. So the total okay. supply of, of USD is, is, is dropping. Okay. All right. Okay, and what you said, they're trying to undo their mistake. You mean like sort of the mistake in Powell's regime, right? You're not talking about like all the way back to kind of Nixon era like that mistake that happened in the 1970s and going on fiat in the first place. That's like, that ship is already yeah, sailed. That's, I, don't, I don't think anybody in the Fed is, in, in, is of that opinion. Okay. Um, you know, it, I, do, I do think that they are worried. So, you know, it's, it's a very difficult place to be. They're really between a rock and a hard place because we're sitting on a huge debt burden. I think it's around 130% debt to GDP. And that's only with you know, without counting for other types of liabilities, then it could, or, or the total of that, this is just government debt. And the problem is, is that you cannot have this massive increase in interest rates while you have this much debt, because you could hypothetically crush, crush growth. And we're already seeing real GDP estimates slowing down quite a bit into next year. So that basically says that next year is going to be very challenging. And the biggest mystery is, um, so I'm going to skip this, is how, how inflation is going to end up. Because inflation right now is just tying the Fed's hands in a way that they can't respond to the events the way they did before. They can't just go in and turn the money printer again. They just can't do it because inflation is too high. 
So what happens with inflation is really what's going to determine how 2023 is going to look like. Are, are, isn't inflation taming now? That's kind of like, oh, like what we're seeing. Of ourselves. Well, tell, tell us, uh, what, what, what do you think? You yeah, guys? so next week we're going to get another CPI print. November's print was a little bit lower than estimate, but it was still in the sevens, right? The, you know, one print doesn't mean that inflation is tamed. Um, and yeah, the market is highly driven by this. The S&P oh. 500. When we say it's in the sevens, that's if you take like the last 12 months, right? That's but right. if you take the current month and then you like project it forward and you annualize it forward, it's actually at a much lower rate. Aren't we talking like, you know, two to 4% range, something like this. But that has a very high base effect to it because you're taking the current level of inflation, which still really hinders consumer spending. Um, especially if we go into a recession, we get some layoffs and things like that. To me, it's not, it's not about the headline number that's as important. It's about okay. the general interest rate environment that is still here because inflation is relatively elevated. Um, and there's two main reasons for this, right? First services are relatively sticky. So energy has come down, right? Um, other commodities are come down, even shelters coming down a little bit, but services is much more difficult for it to come down, especially quickly. So if you think about it, when wages go up or when the price of certain services go up, how, how, how often have you seen those prices come back down once they're adjusted upward? Yeah. yeah, I feel like that that's probably something important to, to hang on. Uh, we're not going to go back to the era of like a three dollar Starbucks. I don't know how much a Starbucks is. I make my coffee at home. I'm sorry, probably like five or six dollars. But we're not going backwards to three dollars. Right. So you're, the point that you're making is like whatever the prices of our service industry products are, are probably going to stay the same. Is that right? With one exception. Right. The okay. one thing that could change is if we get mass layoffs. If we start getting mass layoffs, that's going to change the inflationary picture because that that's going to be then inflation is probably really going to start going down. OK, yeah, but that's bad because then we're in a recession. That's what we don't want. Yeah, but it's yeah, yeah, but we were most likely going to get it. The question is how severe it's going to be. That's really the the base case is we're going to get some sort of recession, whether or not it's going to be shallow or it's going to be deep is really the question. Can I re okay. rephrase that and see if you like how I rephrase it? So we're definitely on the path towards recession. We're definitely having slower economic growth. I think a, a bigger question, a big question is like, does that slower economic growth self refer to itself and become worse as a result? As in like, do we have slower growth because we have slower growth because we have slower growth? As in like, do we lay people off because they, other people got laid off and does this recession start a to recursive feed on is it? Yeah, uh -huh. like I think, is that a fair question to ask? That's a very fair question to ask. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about this. Yeah, retail sales are still above trend from, from last year, but they're slowing down as well. And many other factors. Um, Non-farm payroll to that point, the jobs number is still holding up. And that's really the key um, driver of this, of, this, of this economy, in my opinion, because what you've seen right now is we've gone into a good news, bad news cycle. So on Friday, when we got a positive non-farm payroll uh, hit, uh, markets sold off on it. Why? Because they're worried that if the economy stays strong, the Fed is not going to slow down its interest rate increases. So it's become a backwards world where every time we get any type of good economic news, the market sells off immediately. Yeah, that's insane. I remember, I remember growing up, I was uh, definitely far much more left than I am today growing up. And I was, and I was always just like pissed off that like, there's this disconnect between the uh, economy and the stock market, like the star, the economy is not the star, the economy is not the stock market, stock market's not the economy. Uh, these things are supposed to reflect each other. Now it's actually the opposite as in these things are going against each other. How insane yeah. is this? It's, it's, it's absolutely insane. Uh, but you know, you understand the psychology is everybody is, it's Pavlovian, right? It's the it's 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 right. the, the the bell and and the salivation and we're the dog. We're addicted to liquidity, right? Okay. For twelve years plus, I mean, every time there was a dip, you buy it, you make money, and it's very hard to change that behavior in a short period of time. The uh, the one other graph I'm wondering if you'll pull up for us on the uh, where are we now kind of piece is uh, housing. Um, yeah. I think that's interesting that, that, that affects a lot of people. And what I am stuck kind of um, scratching my head about is like, how are 
people, millennial generation, Gen Z even, how are they going to afford a home? Like, how does this even happen? Because we saw the last 10 years of asset price inflation. We saw the charts. It's like number go up on the house price. And that was at least compensated because you could get like a pretty low mortgage. That's yeah, right. I, at least you could afford your, your, your mortgage payment. But now we have like rapidly increasing fixed price mortgages and the asset prices for the houses really haven't gone that down, down very much. They have not. Tell us what, what are we looking at here? Yeah. So on the right, you can see the, the mortgage rates, which to your point, mortgage rates are now at about 7%, which is just very high, right? We haven't seen that since before the global financial crisis. But at the same time, to, housing prices have gone up a lot or have gone up a lot in, in, the, in the free money era. And they haven't really come down that much. And buyers can't afford. They've, they've basically stepped out of the market. And you can see that here, there's no sales. Sales are virtually at zero. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard buyers can't sell because of, or buyers can't buy because of obvious reasons. Prices are still too high and, intra and mortgage rates are too high. Sellers also can't sell because they're locked into their super low, low rates. It, yeah, low wow. rates. So they're, they're yeah. fixed. So the housing market is just frozen. It's just a stalemate. Finding. It's a stalemate. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So, you know, why would I, why would I trade my 3% mortgage house mm -hmm. to, to go in for almost the same price, 7%, right? I'm just not going to do it. Right. Yeah. And I think the stalemate is going to continue until we start getting the unemployment numbers pick up. So it all depends on the jobs market. If the jobs market starts deteriorating right now, the only sellers that you have is just organic. Let's say there's a divorce or there's a death or something like that. Then, then you get a people selling. But if you want to really see prices falling on mass, you need the labor market to deteriorate. If and when that happens, people won't be able to pay their mortgages and then prices will start plunging. So I feel like we're in this um, in-between uh, phase of things, right? And maybe you could kind of sum, sum up the section of like, um, like, where are we now? It feels like we're not quite in recession, but we're headed towards there. Um, we've got some more work to do on inflation. That's an untold story. Um, we have all of the last, like, I guess, you know, 10 to 15 years of asset price inflation and, um, you know, uh, money and m money printing to deal with as well. Um, what, yeah. what's kind of like the, what's kind of the outlook going into 2023? Uh, and I know a lot depends on kind of the next section we're going to get to, which is, uh, what's Powell going to do the fed pivot. But like, as we're looking down the barrel of 2023 is like recession completely imminent like what do you think is going to happen what trajectory are we on right now i actually think so and i will tell you one of the main reasons is that monetary policy acts with a lag people tend to not get that as much um you know we are having all these interest rate increases and we're like okay we continue with all our lives and it's all normal but one of the things for you to consider for example is just like we have our housing situation and people don't want to switch into a higher mortgage, higher rate mortgage. We have a lot of corporations that borrowed a ton of money during the easy money era at very low rates as well. So S&P 500 companies is an example, or just publicly traded companies to the tune of about six and a half trillion dollars, which is a massive number that's coming due next year and will need to get refinanced into the higher rates. So they don't have the option of just not selling because they don't have a fixed 30 year mortgage during the bond market. When those bonds mature at the low coupon, they have to recycle it to a higher coupon. And I think that's going to be one of the most difficult things. And that's when I think the jobs are going to start getting lost because the increase in debt services for all these corporations will force them to lay off some people. And that's why I think monetary policy works in a lag. And that's why it takes time until you really see all the effects of these things. Okay, so that you think a you, you think a recession, right, is going to happen next year? I'm 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 curious how deep you think this will go, and I'm also curious because, as David was saying, economy, stock market, are different. Uh, what do asset prices do during this time? So, how deep is this recession? How bad is it going to be? Yeah, and then uh, what do asset prices do? So, first off, um, the Fed pivot again. Um, the market doesn't believe we're going to get that much help from the Fed right now, even though markets have rallied over the last month or two in hopes of this uh, markets, meaning uh, stock market. 
what you're seeing here is the dot plot. Each dot represents what a member of the FOMC thinks interest rates are going to be in different time intervals. And then the white is what the market thinks. So the market is looking for 4% rates to last at least until 2024, which is pretty restrictive. So the market does not believe at this time that the Fed can go back to easy monetary policy. And I think that's going to definitely impact um, what kind of recession we're going to get. The market does believe right now that we're going to get a, a pivot around June. So either a slowdown or starting to cut rates. This is what's called the Fed Funds Futures. Market is expecting some, some sort of a pivot around middle of next year. And then to your point, what will markets do? And what is the answer to that question? So <laughs> here you can actually see um, the two different scenarios. There's been a few cases, 1995, 98, and 2019, when the Fed cut rates and it actually saved the economy from going into a recession. It was actually able to stop the recession. Markets were very positive a year later. In the 1989, 2001, 2007, the rate cuts did not stop the recession. It was too late. And a year later, markets were substantially lower. So the answer is, is the Fed pivot going to help? Well, it depends. 50-50, it looks now? like. We got three instances where yes and three no. We got three, three, three instances that the rate cuts saved us from a recession and three instances that they didn't. They did wow. Well, flip a coin, I guess. <laughs> well, <laughs> then you have to look then, then you have to look and make the assumption well are we going to get a recession or not and that's going to answer kind of your your question is the end game and and the, and the scenarios that we have um before we get there mm -hmm. itai uh we got a break we're going to talk to our sponsors but we are um queuing up the last part of this which is i think the big question in my mind which is um are you sure we get another round of this like at some point, the merry-go-round has to stop. And there's the question of like, is this the last loop around? Is this the end game scenario? We're going to ask you after the break. Before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible. In all of my years in crypto, I've never been hacked, scammed, or lost money to a thief. And a lot of that credit goes to my Ledger hardware wallet. The Ledger Nano X and the Ledger Nano S Plus hardware wallets allow users like you and me to secure and manage all of our crypto assets and our NFTs, all with the security of storing users' private keys offline and out of reach from hackers. The Ledger Nano X is the perfect hardware wallet for managing your crypto and NFTs on the go because it connects to your phone with Bluetooth and has a nice big screen for easy transaction readings. Ledger has also upgraded the iconic Ledger Nano S and made the new Ledger Nano S device more DeFi and NFT friendly, making it the perfect hardware wallet for beginners. Ledger has truly maximized for both ease of use and security. So discover which Ledger device is best suited for your journey by going and visiting shop.ledger.com. If you've been listening to Bankless, you know that we're fans of the modular blockchain thesis. The idea that blockchains will separate execution from data availability and consensus, allowing all three to become the best versions of themselves and fuel has built the fastest modular execution layer in the industry. By supporting parallel transaction execution, Fuel unlocks significantly faster throughput for the web free world. Fuel also goes beyond the limitations of the EVM with its own Fuel VM, which is more efficient and optimized, opening up the design space for developers. And lastly, Fuel brings a powerful developer experience with its own domain-specific language, Sway, and a supportive tool chain called Fork. With Fuel, you can have the benefits of smart contract languages like Solidity while adopting the improvements made by the Rust tooling ecosystem, letting the Fuel development environment go beyond the limitations of the EVM. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the show notes to see how you can get involved with the Fuel network. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure, and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. And we are back with Itai, who's going to answer some very big questions for us, at least propose his answers. 
Uh, and Itai, I, I want to ask you this next uh, because we're going to go into the last part of your of your slides of your charts here. Um, the, so this is hap this question has come up to me in a number of macro podcasts uh, about similar subject matters like oh the feds you know we're at the end of the line we're at the end of the sidewalk the, the game's up uh, but then some people always propose like well maybe the game's not up like maybe we get to go and do this one more time and to me like I'm relatively young in the in the East markets world this is this is all still like relatively new to me on the grand scheme of things but for me to say like learn about like okay the entire thing had uh, hangs on the feds policies. Like the entire stock market, the S and P is just tracking the balance sheet. If everyone knows that, can we really get one more go out of it? Because can then we're all just playing the same game. We're like, oh, we're all just gonna make money and lose money together, but we're all playing the same trade. Is that that seems insane? We're all playing the liquidity trade, mm -hmm. and even more so, you know, when when asset prices rise you see a decorrelation, right? Then it appears that everything is doing its own thing. However, when risk assets fall, correlations tend to pick up to one. I would tell you, you can put, put a, plot a chart of Bitcoin, US treasuries, gold, Euro USD, right? Mm -hmm. S&P 500, Germany's DAX, Japanese Nikkei for 2022. You can add multiple more asset classes to this chart, to this list. They're all going to be doing exactly the same thing with different varying degrees of volatility based on what asset price it is, what asset class it is. Everything has been one trade. Okay, so wait. So what you're saying is that doesn't matter what you put as the numerator, Bitcoin, pick your asset, housing, like whatever. It's the denominator that matters. That and everyone is like, oh, I'm so bullish on my particular numerator of choice. But like the real trade is like, no, you trade the denominator. You trade the value of the US dollar. That's right. You trade liquidity. And you can see that the best performing asset in the world this year was actually US dollars. So when I was getting into investing, when was this? 2016, 2017, like put my you know, $5,000 in Robinhood. Uh, I was like <laughs> learning about like the markets. So, like, oh, like I'm going to be bullish on this company because of like it's got this arbitrage opportunity. Like, they like these fundamentals are better. Like, you're telling me like everyone who's playing that game of like picking stocks or like you know managing their portfolio, or I feel like we're all just a bunch of chumps. <laughs> and this is like <laughs> well, <laughs> picking stocks could could work, right? And actually, it works a lot better in a period like this. Uh, because right now, fundamentals of individual companies matter a whole lot more than during a period where the Fed is just lifting the index. I would even argue you can look at passive versus active investing, and you would see that active investing that has been getting a lot of you know, bad rep recently because, oh, indexing beats everything and whatever. Indexing beats everything when the Fed prints money, right? It's obvious. It just floats all, you know, floats all boats. Prior to the GFC, active investing and even hedge fund performance was better than the indexing. And then this year as well, you're seeing hedge funds for the first time in a while really beating the market as well. Sorry, prior to the GFC, the great financial collapse? The great financial crisis. crisis, yeah. Crisis, okay, cool, cool. Okay, so just to reiterate that, you're saying when it's, when it's easy money times, low interest rates, QE, you're saying that like indexing doesn't really matter. Um, but then when we flip that around and we make hard money, more restrictive policy, higher interest rates, that's when being a fundamentals driven investor who's savvy, who's actually playing markets the way that I was told that markets are supposed to be played. That's right. when that actually matters. <laughs> and which actually kind of makes sense because like interest rates, like what's that line? Like uh, when the tide goes out, we'll see who's not wearing any swim trunks. And so That's like, correct. what is the Fed when, when there's 0% interest rates? They're just pushing water up the beach. But now, but so no, it doesn't really matter what fundamentals are. But now, now the water's actually coming out. So now it actually really does matter what fundamentals are. It matters. It matters how you control your leverage, right? Because everybody underwrote this 1% interest rate type of, mm. type of assumption. And now it's 5, 6, 7, right? They have a much bigger debt load to pay, whether it's in real estate, whether it's in corporate financing. So if you are, if you were prudent, if you didn't over lever yourself, if you knew how to manage risk, 
you know, you this is a great opportunity for these companies because all their competitors that don't know how to do that are just going to collapse. Getting wrecked. And that's what we're seeing in crypto. And it, what's interesting is the root of all of this when, when um, the Fed started to change policy. Well, that's when we saw Terra Luna collapse. That's right. And that's where we saw the contagion of like in, in crypto. Guess who's falling? It's all of the risk seekers who were celebrated. I mean, Itai, these people were treated like gods, gods. for the last could like, not fail. Could not fail gods for the last two years. And it's been so infuriating for uh people who have focused on fundamentals, my co-host being one of them, all right. He was doing the right thing. Uh and um like risk seeking was all the rage. And now these these groups are being completely wiped out of this right. market. They're being completely right. wrecked right now. And the people who did have good risk processes and take in, in place, it did not go margin long on crypto, uh, did not go down kind of the stream of um, all of these assets that don't have any fundamentals, didn't go into NFT crazy JPEG world all in and buy the board ape at the top. Um, these people are doing well and everybody else is kind of getting wrecked. And this is all the same trade. It's all one trade. It's all Jerome Powell <laughs> at the end of the day. What he decides to do with the, the money printer, yes? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it even goes much further back. I, I wrote my thesis long, long ago about financial bubbles and the behavior, human behavior is always the same. You know, in the, um, you probably heard of Isaac Newton, right? What people don't know about Isaac Newton is that during his time, there was a very famous bubble that was called the South Sea Bubble, mm -hmm. where um, this company was claiming to bring the wealth of the American continent back to England, and everybody was going crazy because the new world was the thing. Everybody knew that there's all these riches in the new world, and it's going to be worth all this money. So he bought into the South Sea Company stock, saw the price just explode. And it kept going up and up and up. And he was like, well, I'm just going to take my profits and get out, which he did. And then it kept going up and he saw all his friends getting richer yeah. and he couldn't, he <laughs> couldn't deal with the FOMO. And he bought again at the top just to see the whole thing collapse and lose literally 90% of its value. And later he says, you know, I can understand the works of heavenly bodies, but I don't understand the action of men. Look yeah. at this. I, I want to, I want to emphasize this probably top five. Anyway, top 10 list anyone would make of the smartest human beings ever. Isaac Newton is on that list. Smartest human being ever. And he gets messed up by these types, types of uh, emotional roller coaster markets. He loses. If the smartest human being in history <laughs> gets wrecked by these markets, who are you? Why are you, why are you trading against the Fed? Itai, have you read the book, Devil Take the Hindmost? Yes. Great book. Uh, this, that, book. that part was a chapter in this book. And the, what the Devil Take the Hindmost book is, it's like a history of financial bubbles. And like, if, you just, if you're not going to read that, highly recommend that book, by the way, to all Bankless listeners. There's not very many books that I recommend, but there's like a list of 10 of them in the Bankless Discord. For It was a question that somebody in the Discord asked, well, like, what are your books? That, that book is in my top 10 books. And the thing that I learned in this history of financial bubbles, which goes back hundreds of years, hundreds of years, is that humans make financial bubbles. It's not some like thing that we discovered. We didn't discover this shiny rock in the ground and create a financial bubble around it. We didn't do this financial engineering. It's human FOMO that always triggers these financial bubbles. And the best thing about that book is that like, it's this crazy cast of characters of people you already know throughout history. Like, like smart people like Isaac Newton and other like very famous people that you totally know who all get caught up in financial bubbles. No matter who they are or what their background was or how smart they are, they all get caught up in financial bubbles. No, people can't help it. So if you feel bad about your mistakes this cycle, go read that book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Fear and greed never change, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe uh, human beings are the true denominator. The layer along. zero? That's the, mm -hmm. that's the denominator. The layer zero. Beneath the denominator. Um, uh, I mean, we all, okay. we all want to get rich by doing the minimal amount of work possible. Right. So, yeah, so, uh, Itai, can you help us answer this question as we kind of, um, uh, like summarize this and, and all, you know, conclude of, is this the end game is the big question, right? Cause there's this macro story about how many shots do we get at this? And you're, you pr presented that, um, interest rate slide at the very beginning. We're floating at the bottom. <laughs> We're at 0%. Right. Can we go any lower? Um, talk about, oh, I love that, by the way, talk about these possible outcomes that we could see, and then let us know, do we have another 
ride around the, the merry-go-round or just the sidewalk end here is able to say, and can we anticipate something even worse happening uh, that is like much more uh, severe than kind of a, you know, sort of the, the typical standard recession that people are saying might happen? Yeah, so let's cover this um, with a little bit of probability chart to it. So yeah, we've gone to the zero bound. However, the good news is we've just shot up way back above the zero line. We're actually at the highest interest rate environment since back in the uh, 2000s. And we're probably going to top out around 5%. That actually gives the Fed firepower to cut back down if rates go lower. Um, but this is really the old debate between Keynesian school of thought and this Austrian school of thought, which is more uh, on the restrictive side. The Austrian says, well, this is how the money printing game comes to an end. We hit this inflationary period and we have to restructure debt. So what is really the end game? Is the end game going to be some kind of debt forgiveness, restructuring of the US dollar, restructuring of, you know, another Brent Woods in which we, we, we create a commodities back currency? There's a lot of different possibilities, but I don't think we're there quite yet. Um, the good news is that the banking system is a lot healthier than it was in 2008, 2009, because all these years of QE really recapitalized a lot of the banks. And we don't really have these wild lending practices in especially housing and things that are really high ticket that could crash the economy. Another good thing is that home equity is high. So most people's debt to equity ratio in homes that could really collapse the economy is healthy. So those are all the good, the good factors. Now we know the bad factors. We've discussed them quite a bit. So that's why there's these three types of scenarios. Scenario number one is it's really a softish landing. We, we don't really have a real recession. It's more like slow economic growth. The jobs market doesn't really fall apart. Companies are able to hold on, hold on. We go through a period of flattish growth. Inflation calms down. Fed is able to cut rates back to two, 3%, not really zero. We go back to Goldilocks, we go back to a healthy period, Fed doesn't come back to money printing, and things will kind of heal out organically because things will grow. That's sort of the optimistic scenario. This is the um, scenario in which the Fed wins. That's the scenario in which the Fed wins. That's the scenario that a lot of people in the market believe. Um, and every time that we hear talks about a Fed pivot or things like that, the stock market celebrates that because people want to believe in that. They tend to be naturally optimistic. The softest landing is the hopium take. Yeah, yeah. So then there is the hard landing, which is a tough recession, but not necessarily a catastrophic one. We think that's the base case, um, primarily because we don't know how much leverage is really out there in shadow lending. We have an idea. We know that monetary policy works in a lag, and we do believe that job losses are going to come, and they're very likely to come because corporations, once the wave of refinancing happens, they will lay off people in order to offset the decrease in their earnings. Once that happens, it will probably cause lower housing prices. Housing is a very strong fundamental factor of the economy, less purchasing of you know, furniture and all this kind of stuff. Um, similarly, consumer spending 70% of the US economy. Once people lose jobs, they can't spend as much. That creates actually a down cycle. So there's a lot of negative feedback loops that can trigger in this scenario, which is why we call it the most likely scenario. Now. Why is it not a catastrophic scenario? Um, it's really the banking system and systemic risk. If systemic risk doesn't trigger and we don't get Lehman and we don't get things of that nature um, because banks are supposedly healthier, we don't know what we don't know, right? But if there is no debt crisis, it's eventually probably gonna work itself out. And after a period of recession, inflation will come down and we'll start growing again potentially from a, from a better place. That's if there's no systemic risk, if there's no like FTX hanging out there. That's right. But if there is right. an FTX hanging out there, then we veer more towards catastrophic. Yes. So the catastrophic landing is potentially the, the end game that will require real restructuring of things. And this scenario, imagine a Bank of America, or I'm just giving an example. Obviously, I'm not saying Bank of America is going to go down under, but like a Wells Fargo, a Bank of America, a J.P. Morgan Chase. It's probably Wells Fargo, right, David? We, we like a to Deutsche, pick on a Deutsche Wells Bank, Fargo a here. Deutsche Bank, a Numera. Like it could very well start internationally. Actually, more more likely, it's going to start internationally if it does. Particularly Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, all that kind of stuff. Um, systemic risk, bank runs. 
you know, no money in the ATM, like bail-ins, this kind of stuff. Uh, if that spreads across the West and at the same time, inflation stays elevated, maybe because of supply side shocks. So imagine, you know, commodity prices, the war in Ukraine expands, like different things that can cause supply side shock. Tie the Fed hands from being able to ease too much into this type of condition. That is the catastrophic scenario, but we assign a lower probability to that. Have people in their lifetime living, like right now uh, in general, have, have we experienced anything that you would label as catastrophic? Was 2008 catastrophic or do we have to go all the way back to like the 19 you know 20s late 1920s and early 30s to to label something catastrophic what's the difference between hard landing and catastrophic if you could bring us yeah. back to kind of life experience i think 2008 was hard landing because at the end of the day the catastrophic was avoided lehman did collapse but inflation was not a problem the fed was able to bail out the banks um prevent the systemic risk there was systemic risk it did have the potential of deteriorating to the point of catastrophic, but it did not. Um, I think you have to go back to, I mean, we do have it in other countries. We can see Greece in 2010 or um, other places, you know, uh, in, in, in more modern history. But I think for the West, you really have to go back to 1929 in order to, to envision what catastrophic means. A 25% chance of something worse than 08. Uh, not, not liking those odds. Uh, maybe this is uh, hopium, copium, but, uh, uh, we were talking earlier about how the economy and the stock market is inversed. And so is it is it hopium to think that like if we get something catastrophic like an OA moment, we'll just turn on the money printer and be good again? Yeah, in a way, that's one of the arguments that says that if we do get that, it will end up being bullish net net because regardless of the inflationary environment, the Fed will have no choice but to step in. This is so, so dumb. <laughs> what is this? Bullish world? for asset prices though, right? Not necessarily like because like... How much yeah, do we more, just get even more wealth inequality? And that's a question I had. Like, that's the thing that the Fed's not measuring, right? But we see it. We see the ripples in our society and the fraying of our politics. And like, how much more wealth inequality can a society really sustain before it breaks and starts to elect populist riot. leaders that, you know, turn Weimar Republic into the into kind of the next thing after it? Um, that's the risk. Yeah. That's, that's a definitely a political risk. I know Ray Dalio touches a lot on this as well in the New World Order. Th this is definitely this is definitely reminiscent of some of those some of those periods, kind of late empire type of debates. Mm -hmm. But I, I I don't disagree. Uh, but it's beyond my my ability to predict the future political and geopolitics um, implications for this. Okay, so but, go ahead, I was just going to say seventy five percent probability that we get another round at this. I think so. Uh, with a fifty percent probability of a hard landing that's not catastrophic, how? And you said like, okay, it'll just play itself out over time. We'll have a recessionary period. We'll just deal with it. It'll be hard. We'll have to cut down our spending. But fine. How long? Like one to five years? How? What's what's in a recessionary period like? It's typically shorter. I mean, honestly, it's less than eighteen months. But the implication oh. of it is is you know, that's the trough, but then the recovery, it depends what kind of recovery you get, mm. right? That's going to be hard to predict. Recovery could be V-shaped, it could be slow. Um, and obviously there's the scenario no one wants to talk about, which is Japan, which is just anemic growth for decades following right. a top. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with demographics as well. So one of the reasons that I don't subscribe into permanently high inflation is because I just don't think we have the population to support it. It's not the 60s and 70s. We don't have an insane amount of boomers coming out and starting to buy houses and all that. We skip this slide. Um, we can talk about the yield curve if we have time at the end, because that's a very that's a very good tool to predict future recession, which is very much inverted, which is implying uh, we're going to get a recession very soon. But if we go into this chart, what you can see here is the age wave. And age wave is the percentage of the labor force ages 16 to 34. It's a very good predictor of inflation because that's the age in which you're getting your first real job with a real paycheck. You're getting married. You may have your first kid or so, and you may buy your first home. Hmm. All the things that I just described are massively inflationary right. when they happen en masse. Kids are inflationary. <laughs> Kids are inflationary buying homes. Yeah, imagine imagine right. what goes into starting a family. Right. 
buying a car and buying a home. Like I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a chart like this. So this red line is the age wave you're saying, and we sort of it definitely peaked in the kind of the the 70s, the late 70s, I guess. Early 80s when U.S. inflation peaked. So we've seen a very tight correlation between oh. the percentage of population in that age group and the inflationary trend. And as you well know, the U.S. birth rate is around 1.8. Um, which is below replacement at 2.1. Even with immigration, it's barely at 2.1. What we're looking at is the the baby boomers basically coming of age, becoming 16 to 34 in That's the right. early 80s. That's right. And then, and then it, it falls off from there all the way like to kind of like almost like lows. And you can see that also with the age wave and the 10 year, 10 year yield. So this is why I believe this inflation is really just a monetary phenomenon. It's not an organic phenomenon. If it was the, the 80s and 70s, it wasn't really because of printing. It was an organic phenomenon of a lot of people coming to age at the same time and all grasping for resources at the exact same time, which causes organic inflation. We don't have that now. We have monetary inflation. This well, we, we, sort of... What about the meme of the COVID baby? My sister had a COVID baby. Uh, I've seen a bunch of COVID babies in my life. A lot of people had COVID babies. What about that? It's, like it's not. If you look at it statistically, the birth rate is still low. It's Isn't not. That? It's, it's not that it's not that massive. I mean, on a on a relative basis, though, the U.S. is substantially better than the EU and Japan. The EU birth rate is really low. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I think it's around 1.4, maybe 1.5. So it's far below replacement rate in Japan. It's far below replacement rate. And net, net, I think long term, you need people in order to drive inflation, because if you literally have less people than replacement rate over time, you're going to have less demand for the same housing inventory and cars and all those things. I've so, always wanted to do an entire episode, David, on uh, demographics, actually, because um, China, China is actually in a in worse place right. than the U.S. too, which is there's some countervailing uh, you know points there. If their demographics are kind of kind of weak, yet you know the, anyway, it's it's very interesting. You tell you I uh, touch on this, but uh, since somebody in the uh, YouTube chat asked the question, I, I'd like you to go back to it. Uh, question from Dan. Uh, fun fact: I do actually watch the chat. Can immigration compensate the lack of boomers? I mean, it, it, it can to a point, but immigration also has slowed down and it's also a political issue, right? Mm. So if you look at the EU, for example, that's exactly what they try to do. They try to open their borders to a lot of immigration because of their population decline. And it caused a lot of social rift within their societies. And it caused, for example, in Italy, we just had um, populist right get voted in. In Sweden, we had the same thing. So even though it can, in theory, it's very different than can, will the society actually accept it? particularly okay, so, when times are tough and everyone yeah. is like talking about ways to split the pie. Right. So this, this sounds like good news. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah. So, so net net, this is why I believe that inflation will eventually subside if the fed really start stops um, all the money intervention we're right now that they are. So that's why I believe th this is one of the reasons I don't think we're going to reach the end game just yet because this oh, wait. really helps. We're, yeah. we're going around again? Yeah. We'll mark it round two? We'll mark I'm, it round I'm two thinking eventually. like 2024, 2025 is when I'm planning my bull market. I don't know oh, about you guys. Yeah. I well. think it's going to be sooner than that because the second the market sniffs it out, the market usually prices these things out six to 12 months before the reality actually even happens. Hmm. So... So would, what are you doing? What, like, how are you thinking about this? So market continues to go down for a while, but then starts to turn in 2023? I think the turn happens in 23. Yeah, if you ask me, I think around mid-23 um, potentially is when, when things happen. Uh, we've been in a bear market now since for a year. Um, usually bear markets don't last more than 18 months. It all kind of lines up. Uh, but it really depends how severe things get. The base case is they don't get that severe. Um, even, even if, even in a tough recessionary environment, I mean, you know, stocks could go 20% lower from here. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that, that would put it in within an average, you know, 40% decline type is not, is not crazy for a recessionary bear market. Mid 2023. And David, if uh, crypto is front run that by six months, then we already bottomed. Yeah, I was about to say, Ryan, you're running out of time to get your three digit ether, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it may happen. I'll give my uh, thirty percent prob no twenty five percent probability. The number is going digit. down. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. One last question for you, Itai, to kind of because you you brought up uh, Ray Dalio and you got some charts on here about um, the dollar, which is always like um, when we talk about uh, is it the end? Do we get one last cycle, one last shot at this, or no? 
Um, yeah. You know, Dalio talks about when empires kind of fall, the last thing they sort of lose is reserve currency status. Yes. And um, how is the dollar looking from a reserve currency status perspective right now? Is it weaker? Is it stronger? And like, how do you forecast that moving into um, you know the next uh, couple of years or like you know ten years? We can probably spend two hours talking just about this. Um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll try to make it brief. Um, you know, dollar is still strong as far as global reserve currency because a lot of the lending that takes place um, is in U.S. dollars, and it's a self-fulfilling kind of loop. So imagine even a company drilling off the coast of Norway, potentially doing business with the U.K., is going to do it in dollars and borrow money in dollars. So it's a self-fulfilling loop. 60% of foreign exchange reserves are still US dollars, but those numbers have declined slowly over time. And I think one of the risks to the dollar as a reserve currency is literally what we're seeing right now with Russia and Ukraine, as an example, right? Russia doesn't like it at all. China doesn't like it. Um, the more sanctions the West puts on countries like this, the more incentivized they are to find workarounds around the US dollar as a global reserve currency. Um, and typically when, when these reserve currency status is lost. It's very rare that it's like, you know, it's Monday, the dollar is the reserve currency, Tuesday, okay, it's not. It's a very gradual process that might take decades. So you won't even realize that it's happening while it's happening. That's the most likely outcome. There will be more and more use of other things over time until at some point, the dollar is always going to be important, but is it going to be the only currency we're transacting with? Probably not. All I'm hearing, maybe I want to be hearing this, is that we have enough runway to do this all one more time <laughs> why do you only want one more david what happens after that one at least well, so i can sell one. the top next time <laughs> <laughs> it's um and the u.s is in a relatively very good place relatively to the rest of the world you know we're talking about all these potential negative implications but the rest of the world is much worse right china is worse japan is worth worse the eu is worse so it's kind of the 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 cleanest dirty shirt syndrome yeah where where do you go and it's still the us is still the most stable the political system is still considered very stable um property rights very well respected the probability of bail-ins is virtually very you know with the exception of uh, i don't know if you know about the uh, 1933 order to take all the gold away oh uh, we've heard about that familiar. one we yeah. talked about that a few times so with the exception of that which i think would probably not happen again there's not going to be a 2023 take your take your crypto take your order. bitcoin yeah i mean there is there's is precedent for that right but it's um it's unlikely and that you know if that happens then the u.s government risks its status as the safe haven where when thing, things get tough money from the rest of the world li literally flows to the u.s typically. because because we got good property rights yeah yeah very He's stable system. This has been great. I mean, I feel like you just did a bang up job answering these four questions. How did we get here? Where are we now? When do we pivot? And is this the end? Um, thank you for this. And um, you know, is there any anything you would sort of leave folks with? Like, should we? Yeah. What's your kind of advice? How would you How would you summarize this? If somebody's like, okay, Itai, Itai, what what should I do as a result of all of this? Um, how How can they prepare? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a great question. Um, I would say that the go to advice is always increase your productivity, make sure that especially during a recession, you save more, you invest more, so you have the dry powder in order to do it when things really go on sale. You don't over leverage yourself. You don't go into debts that you can't afford, and during a high during a period of high interest rates, you don't want to be exposed to these type of debts that you have to pay massive amounts for. So first take control of your own personal finances, especially during these periods that you see them as an opportunity rather than a challenge. Increasing your productivity sure sounds a lot like building to me. That's what I hear, yeah. Ryan. <laughs> this is time to put heads down building, heads down building. Um, you know, a lot of times recessions are a good time to go back to school and things like that. If it's more difficult to find a job, make yourself more, competitive makes yourself more appealing um when coming out of it there's going to be a lot of opportunities typically out of you know the recovery out of recessions is usually one of the best periods to take advantage of opportunities 
Itai, this has been absolutely fantastic. You're a wealth of information, uh, my friend. We're so glad we had you uh, on this episode. Um, I guess l last question for you before I, b before I thank you, but um, are these slides publicly available anywhere? Is there a link that we can include in the show notes? Um, they're actually our internal, they're internal company. Oh, uh, secret slides. slides. Okay. <laughs> so Perfect. it's our, it's our asset management <laughs> team slides. We typically don't share it. It's just for our internal uh, research. Okay. Thank you so well, much for putting them together. Yeah, we appreciate it. Where can folks find out more about you and uh, about w what you're doing at uh, Equi? Uh, yeah, equi.com is a good place to start. Um, we do have a pretty substantial wait list right now. I think it's over 2,000 people trying to get access to the platform. However, we are going to have it um, reduce the minimum and open it to a much wider amount of people uh, in 2023. And um, the whole idea is how do we how are we able to invest in a way that's not correlated to all this craziness and how can we maintain the value of our money money and we've been able to do just that this year despite all the all the volatility so well that sounds real nice right about now uh so thank you for sharing that we'll include a link in the show notes uh where you can uh sign up for the wait list and find out more about that um itai thank you so much for joining us we appreciate you no problem it was, it was my pleasure Bankless Nation, as always, got to let you know, at the end of the show, none of this was financial advice. We really don't know exactly what's going to happen next year or in the future. And of course, got to remind you that crypto is risky, ETH is risky, Bitcoin is, but so are the macro markets. Uh, you could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot.